Praise the Lord, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Apostolic Tabernacle of the Felicianus today. If there's any guests here, I'd like to uh, greet them this evening if we could when it's over with and just give them a hand of, hand of applause and welcome them here. If we will, let's join in prayer. Let's start this off with prayer uh, and then we'll let Sister Mills lead us in worship. Anybody's got any needs, any prayer requests, come up and minister. Be glad to pray with you. Why don't we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? How many thankful for His grace? Hallelujah, hallelujah. You can remain standing. We're going to go to the, to the word of the Lord, 2 
Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the 7th verse. We're going to read down through the 10th verse. Hallelujah. Good to see everybody in the house of the Lord. We have several, several out on vacation, several, several out sick, different things, but I'm glad to see you here today. The Bible says, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing, Paul said, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Usually, if I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm planning on preaching the second service also today. Usually it's that second service that I'm trying to find that confirmation in. I'm trying to, I'm preaching or whatever. But today it was the first service and I was trying to get the mind of God in. I'm kind of settled unless God does something different in the second. And I said, God, I need a, I know I'm teaching or whatever you want to call it. Maybe in preaching time we're done, but I need a confirmation. And, um, this was the uh, song, Sister Mills had no idea what I was planning on uh, talking about today, but I want to talk about an additive called grace, an additive called grace. Why don't you lay your Bibles down right now, and let's just lift our hands to heaven right now. God, we love you. We worship you. We need you in this house, God. We need you in this place. We need your direction, God, to speak to our hearts, our souls, and our minds, and our spirit right now, God. Because we want a word from you in this place. We want you to speak into our hearts, our souls, and our minds, and our spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Most of us here today are facing something uncomfortable that we would like God to remove from our lives. I would venture to say that if I ask the individuals within this room right now, that every one of you would say that there was something within your life that you would change if you could. If you had the power to, the ability to. I know I certainly would. There are people in this room that is facing something devastating something tragic if each of us were to 100 percent be transparent today there would be many stories of unimaginable pain that people in this room could tell some of you are carrying scars from childhood wounds some of you are still bleeding from wounds that you received even as an adult it's easy to begin to see life through the eyes of Job's trouble when Job said, man that is born of a woman is few of days and few, excuse me, full of trouble. Allow me to say this, that this precious statement that Job made is not God's view of life. Rather, it is the Bible that is recording Job's view on life at that particular moment in time. So the question this afternoon is not, have you been through anything? But the question that I have for each and every individual, including myself in this place, is instead of have you been through anything, are you overcoming the things that you're going through? For whomever this message today is intended, I want you to leave this service today convinced that whatever trial, whatever test, 
trouble comes your way into your life. Uh, the trouble did not come alone. Uh, but there is an additive called grace uh, that comes along uh, with your trouble. Uh, God did not allow, tr allow trouble to come into your life with not sending an additive called grace uh, to help you make it through it. Hallelujah, brothers and sisters. I want to drive this point home to you today. I want to preach it into your spirit and let it get deep down within your soul. I want to preach it so that you're convinced that God is going to carry you through. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. But I, I he said, I, he's talking about him. I will go with you even to the end of the world. What do I mean when I say grace? When I feel the Holy Ghost, I had no I did not have this until about 8, 9 o'clock last night. Something began to burn in my spirit, and, and I was just sitting there on the couch, and within just a few minutes, I, I felt this coming to me, and I had planned all week long on teaching on something different ever since last Sunday. But what do I mean when I say grace? How does one define grace, Brother Mills? Well, the common definition of grace that you will often hear is this, unmerited favor. And that is a certain, a accurate description of one aspect of grace. But if that is not the extent of the grace of God. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 and 13 that there have no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. I, I said God is faithful. I'm going to say it one more time to so some of you in this place get a hold of what I'm saying. God is faithful no matter what you're going through. No matter what you're facing today. God is still faithful. I don't care if you're sick. I, I don't care if you're discouraged. God is still faithful. Hallelujah. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. But will with the temptation. Not without the temptation. Will with the temptation. Also make a way to escape. That you may be able to bear it. No temptation. Taken you, but such is common to man. It's easy when you're going through the trial and when you're going through the test to think that there is something unique about your situation. That nobody else has ever went through what you're going through. We like to think that we are going through something that no one else has ever went through before. There's a reason that we like to think that. If it is indeed true that we were the first to face our particular situation, then we would have an excuse for not facing it. And we would have an excuse to give up. But God is letting us know huh? you're not going to face anything huh? that somebody else has not already faced. Huh? You're not going to deal with anything that somebody else has not already dealt with. And if God brought them through it, huh? he'll bring you through it. Huh? If my God, huh? I wish some of you would get a hold of what I'm feeling in this place right now. If God will bring you through it, huh? he'll bring me through it. Huh? If God will bring me through it, huh? he'll bring you through it. Huh? I'm here to tell you, you're not in this by yourself. You're not in this alone. Well, I got some of you awake in that place anyway. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is faithful. I've typed that so many times over the last few days in a text message. Somebody would text me and say, Brother Mills, I'm feeling better. The sickness is gone. And I would type back, God is faithful. God met this need. God took care of this problem. God took care of this situation. And all I can say is, God 
is faithful. I couldn't say it was because of you. I couldn't say it was because of me. I couldn't say it was because of something that I did. Because of something that you did. I couldn't say it was because the boss man provided. I couldn't say it because the doctor provided. I couldn't say it. All I can say is because God he is faithful. God he is faithful. God is faithful. Not tempted above what I am able. You have got to know that your temptation is not above your ability. God has confidence in you, sir. God has confidence in you, ma'am. If he allowed it to come your way, Sister Smith, it's because he trusted that you could go through it. He's not going to put more upon you than you're able to bear. So he's got confidence that you're able to go through every trial and test that he allows to come your way. God trusts you. He will make a way of escape that you will be able to bear it. Well, what if it gets to the place where it just gets too heavy? Just start looking for an escape route. Because God will make a way of escape so that you'll be able to bear it. You can't just pray that God will open the door and then be like Rhoda. Peter's knocking at the door. They're having an all-night prayer meeting in there that Peter beat and be get out of prison. And Peter's knocking at the door and she won't open the door. You got to recognize when God's opening the door and then you got to walk through it. This thing called grace was shined upon the church in Acts 4 and 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant into their service that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth from thy hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed... I said, when they had prayed, I still believe in the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. When they had prayed, the place was shaken. And they were assembled, they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. I wish we would get to the place that every one of us in this place would start praying. That we're all assembled together. And at one time, every one of us are filled with the Holy Ghost. And then we will begin to speak the Word of God with boldness. What are you so worked up about? Because a lot of times I pastor bipolar saints. What are you trying to say, Brother Mills? That we're up one day and we're down the next. We come in here with our lip on the ground one day and then we're bouncing off the walls the next. I can't help it what kind of day you got. My God has not changed. I don't serve him off of feelings. I don't serve him off of emotion. He's the same God. Yesterday, today, and forever. He's God and he changed not. I woke up in this morning and it was still true. That this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Let us be glad in it. Hallelujah. And the multitude of them. That believe we're of one heart and one soul. We come in unity, one mind and one accord. Neither said he any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And I like this part right here in red. And great grace was upon them all. Let's examine our text that I read in our main text today to see what the Bible has to say about the thorn. We know that Paul was overwhelmed. He said, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. 
Paul was in danger, it seems, of becoming so heavenly minded as to be of no earthly use. There was the danger that he might become exalted above measure. After all, the kind of revelations and the kind of visions given to Paul were very much up there. Paul used the word here when he's talking about this. He's talking about describing the danger. It means to be over exalted. The only other place where the word occurs in the New Testament is in connection with the coming man of sin. Who in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 4, who opposes and exalted himself above all that which is called God or that is worship. So prevent this kind of thing, Paul said, from happening to him and to his ego. God gave him a thorn in the flesh to buffet him. I want you to understand something. The devil didn't give this thorn. God gave this thorn. The devil didn't allow this to happen. God allowed this to happen. To buffet him. The word used is means to hit Brother McDaniels with a clenched fist. Whatever it was that God sent his way was to remind him of his utter mortality. It seems to have assailed him um, along two lines. It's called a thorn in the flesh. The word for thorn occurs only here in the New Testament. The word is derived from one denoting a pointed stake. It can be rendered a splinter. Whatever it was, it hurt Paul physically. It was both hurtful, it was also humiliating. Some have viewed it as a stake driven through the flesh. There's been much debate about the identity of what Paul's thorn was. There's been a number of suggestions that maybe it was a medical condition like epilepsy and eye trouble and headaches and, and uh, malaria and migraines, on and on and on. There's no lack of high profile person that advocates these different various positions. However, what or who the thorn was to Paul is not exactly relevant today in what I'm talking to you about. But what is important is that God granted grace to Paul for his thorn. I believe the reason that the Lord is not letting us know exactly what that thorn is is so that you can put your situation into what Paul was dealing with and say, if I have a thorn, Paul had a thorn. If God gave him grace, gotta give me grace. If God brought him through, gotta bring me through. The thorn is the flesh. What is it? Well, I suggest the better question is instead of what is it, who is it? Paul's thorn in the flesh, I believe, was a person. My reason are as follows Paul identifies the thorn in the flesh as the messenger of Satan. The term messenger always refers to beings, whether angelic or human. The image that Paul uses echoes language from the Old Testament. The phrase thorns in the flesh, eyes, sides, is used in the Old Testament in Numbers 33 and 55, in Joshua 23 and 13, Judges 2 and 3, but it always refers to human enemies. It seems very clear to me that if we restrict our interpretation to the biblical use of the phrase thorn in the flesh, that we must conclude that Paul's thorn in the flesh was a personal enemy. Who then was Paul's thorn in the flesh? It seems clear to me from that context that Paul's thorn in the flesh was an imposter, apostle that was seeking to destroy Paul's personal credibility. Hallelujah. Therefore, destroying his mission at hand, which was to the Gentile church. If you've ever had a thorn in your hand or anywhere else, the natural impulse is to do what Paul said. I want it out. And your natural impulse is to pull that thorn out of your flesh Paul said 
there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Paul recognized there was given to me, given a thorn in the flesh. Paul recognized the thorn as a gift from God. It was a gift that was given to him to prevent pride, being self-exalted. The thorn was a gift to prevent his own self-destruction. Regardless of how painful the thorn was, the destruction and fall that follows pride and a haughty spirit would have been much more painful. The thorn, the messenger of Satan, and Paul's flesh was a gift from God. How do I know that the thorn, the messenger of Satan, was from God and not from Satan himself? Because the purpose of the thorn proves from whence it came. The purpose of the thorn was to prevent Paul's prideful self-exaltion. To exalt himself above what he should be. Satan would not have prevented that. Satan would have wanted for that to happen. But God used Satan in Paul's life just like he did in Job's life to accomplish God's perfect will. We have the same default response to our thorns, messengers from Satan, as Paul did. We begin to try to pray them away. I said, we begin to try to pray them away. We curse them. We rebuke them. We rebuke the devil. And it was a gift from God. It didn't come from the devil. Think about it. You speak in tongues over them. And the reason they did not go anywhere is because the hell that's in your life was heaven sent, not devil sent. Child of God, the thorn is a God's gift to you. Stop rebuking it and find out why the Father gave it to you in the first place. Paul was not only overwhelmed by the severity of his affliction. Whatever it was, he was overruled. He said, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. The three times the Lord prayed in the garden of Gethsemane that the cup might be removed from him. Paul prayed and the attack was renewed. He prayed again, and the attack was renewed. He prayed yet again, and the attack was renewed. You ever prayed, and the more you prayed about it, it seemed like the stronger it gets? You may need to analyze what your prayer is about. I, I know this is not a popular message, because we want somebody to tell us why well, don't, we don't feel good, because I like to do the same thing. But as long as you're fighting against the will of God, you're going to stay in circles. But if you can allow God's perfect work to be done in your life, you will look back and realize it was for your good and not for your doom. And the trial will get over a whole lot quicker when you accept that it's the will of God instead of fighting against it. Paul prayed and again his attack was renewed over and over. He prayed again and he prayed again thrice. Thing that terrible as it was was from God. We can well imagine how Paul agonized in prayer over this assault upon him, especially when his prayers went unanswered. His petitions were overturned by God, who knows best, who makes no mistakes, and loves us with a love beyond degree. Paul sought the Lord three times to remove the thorn from his life. God denied Paul's request to remove, but he told him, my grace is sufficient. The thorn came to Paul for the worldly, but the thorn did not come by itself. An additive called grace came with it. Brothers and sisters, 
This is what I've come to preach to you. You cannot prevent the thorn, the messenger of Satan, from coming into your life. I'm going to say it again. You cannot prevent the thorn, the messenger of Satan, from coming into your life. But the thorn, the messenger of Satan, cannot prevent grace. From coming into your life. You can't stop. The thorn. But he can't stop grace. You can't stop the storm. But he can't stop God. Walking on your water. And saying peace be still. I'm here to preach to you. That his grace. Is sufficient. For your thorn. The question is. If the thorn is in my life from God. Then why do I need grace to deal with it? Because the thorn is painful. Because the thorn is dealing with something so deep. In my human psyche. In my pride. In my self image. That without grace. I would become angry. I would become bitter. With the thorn. Left to my own carnality, God's thorn in my flesh would destroy me. Many people have backslid because of the thorn. Not because the thorn was designed to destroy them, Brother McDaniel, but because they misunderstood who sent the thorn and what its purpose was. This is why God doesn't just send the thorn, but he sends grace with it. God does not intend for the thorn to destroy you, but God intends for the thorn to develop you, saint of God, to develop you into a person that he can exalt within his purpose. The thorn will not destroy me. The thorn will not destroy you, sir. It will not destroy you, ma'am, because grace comes with the thorn. The thorn will come. It's divine purpose because grace comes with it. The thorn will release God's perfect power in my life because grace comes with it. But then, Paul was overjoyed. He said, unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul was given a revelation of God's sufficiency and of God's strength. It was God's matchless grace that came along with the affliction. All sufficient grace. Grace which moment by moment enabled Paul not only to bear the pain, the torment of it all, but to accept it as a matter, a fact of life. It was to be accepted as part of that. Romans 12 and 2 talks about that, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. My mom's probably favorite scripture that I've ever heard her quote growing up and even today. All things work together for the good. Got a revelation on that several years ago, Brother Darrell. It don't say all things feel good. It says all things work together for the good. Just because it's for your good don't mean it's going to feel good. You got to trust that God's in control. He knows what he's doing. He don't make mistakes. And even if it does come, I, I want to assure you something. Even if it does come from the devil, he's got to get permission from God to do anything that he does to a child of God. So God is sitting back and saying, I believe in you. I trust you. I've got confidence in you. But you're going to keep holding the, winning the fight, fighting the good fight, keeping the faith. Not only God's grace, but God's power. 
He said, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. The word for strength here, it's in Demaeus, it is the usual word for God's unlimited power. Paul learned that while he did not have the power to overcome the incredible handicap of the thorn, God did. In fact, his very weakness and yieldingness enabled God to work as never before in Paul's life. Paul so overcame his affliction that it was virtually ignored altogether in the Bible. It did not hinder him from undertaking three missionary journeys. And we follow him across Asia Minor into Europe, on to Rome, and we never suspect that Paul had a handicap at all. In fact, it would have been ignored by him altogether had not the Holy Ghost told him to write about it because the Holy Ghost knew me and you needed to hear it. God's grace was not only sent to Paul, God's grace was seized by him. He became a praising man. He said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Most of us, including your pastor, go around complaining about our infirmities. We make them an excuse to do nothing. We allow ourselves to overcome or excuse me, to become embitter against God because of them. Or we use them as weapons to victimize other people in order to get sympathy. But Paul did not just accept his infirmity. He accepted it gladly. The word used here is derived, it simply means sweet. It simply means that Paul accepted his terrible handicap with a sweetness. And thus he became a prevailing man. In these remarkable few lines that Paul sets for three things about God's power in the life of the believer. He intimates a source of power. He said that the power of Christ may rest up on me. Many believers, every one of us, pray for power. But God does not give his power to us so often. It is far too potent and a dynamic of a force for that to happen. And it will destroy us. It has been well said. It has been often proven that all power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. James and John once revealed what they would have done with the power had it been given unto them. But Paul recognized that the Lord's power could only be attained on God's terms. And in his case, those terms included that piercing thorn. He recognized. See, I, I remember what it was like. I grew up in a different generation. This I tried to act young, Sister Margie, but this may date me. I grew up, you know that nanny that I've been talking about, praying about, and thank God she's at home. Hallelujah. But I, I've been going up there. I remember her sending me out, and hardly anybody outside of my mom that I love more, and my dad that I love more than her. But she sent me outside to get my own switch. Now, anybody ever sent you to get your own switch? Mr. Marsh, you, you shaking your head like you've done that a time or two. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We, we may have Sister Margie get some lessons around here at one of these services. Hallelujah. She sent me out to get me. A, and, and I remember, I thought, I get my own switch. Kind of like this. I don't get one that's going to break her off. You know, it's, you know, it's just, you know, just one of these little. And I remember, first time I brought one of me and Brother Shannon that, a little twig, looked like it wouldn't take much to break that thing. She sent me back out there. She said, you get, you, you get, you get one off that rose bush right there. That's what a switch is. It's still green. And then she gave me a whooping. And then I won't be stubborn to not cry. And then she'd whoop me until I did cry. Then she'd say, if you don't quit crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. 
Man, I was more confused. I didn't know what to think. You know, hallelujah. It's like, it's like a parent asking a kid, what'd you do that for? And when they answer, shut up. What do you do here? But I didn't like that thorn. And now, believe me, she didn't whoop me with the thorns. She picked those off. I picked them off on my way back. <laughs> what was I doing? I was picking off those thorns, or she was picking off the thorns, whatever, because I realized that wasn't going to feel good. Going through the woods, and I grew up in the hills of Kentucky, and man, it's going through those briar patches and going through all those gullies and and I, 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 that was my life. That's what I lived in the hills right there. And, and they, I, I, I know what hills and hollers are all about. Hallelujah. And I grew up living in that. And all them clubhouses. And, you know, we would build as boys and all through there. And going through there and the cooker bears and all that kind of things. And, I mean, you get to running through there. And then you go through the wrong patch. It might take your clothes off. It grab a hold of you. And you learn, man, I want to stay away from that, that part. I want to stay away from there. Paul reveals that the Lord's power can only be attained on his terms. You've got to be willing to deal with the thorns. We've heard it said all of our life. People said, he never promised you a rose garden. Well, he did promise you a rose garden. He just forgot to remind you there's some thorns in them rose bushes. You got to take the whole package. So Paul goes forward and he says, Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities. He reveals next the scope of the power. The power enables Paul to overcome pain. That constant pain that stabbed into him, whether physical, spiritual, or both, actually gave Paul pleasure. The word means to delight in his infirmities or to enjoy his infirmities. It enables Paul to overcome all of this that is coming against him. He said, I take pleasure in reproaches. The word here, it can be rendered insults. The word is used by Paul when warning the ship captains and the centurion that if they left fair havens for the open sea at that time of the year, it would result in hurt and much damage to the ship. When the ship was about to wreck, Paul reminded him them of his warning. And he used the word again. He said in Acts 27 and 21, he said, Sir, ye should have hearkened unto me, and they have not been loose from credit, and to have gained this harm and loss. The power of Christ enabled Paul to rise triumphantly above all such hurtful, such harmful insults and problems. They were a mirror Almost like a needle, pin pricks compared with his thorn. And nothing when compared with God's grace and Christ's power. It enabled Paul to overcome. This, he said, I take pleasure in necessities. The word can be translated needs. Paul accepted them as he accepted everything else. These things were as nothing compared with his major handicap. He didn't waste a moment moaning about such things. It enabled Paul to overcome persecutions. He said, I take pleasure in persecutions. He was living on the high plateau of the Sermon of the Mount. Few of God's saints ever pitched their tents. On these table lands. But Paul did. Jesus did. He said. And Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 11 through 12. He said blessed. Or that word means happy. Are ye. When man shall revile you. Shall persecute you. Shall say all manner of evil against you. Falsely. Even if it's on Facebook. what some of you are sitting there thinking God would have never wrote that if he'd known we was going to have Facebook for my sake 
But he said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. The power of Christ on which Paul now drew as natural as he drew on God's grace, as naturally as he drew the breath that he breathed, enabled Paul to live on such a plane. It enabled Paul to overcome problems. He said, I take pleasure in distresses. The word literally means a narrow place. Paul had been in many tight corners before. He had faced a seemingly great multitude of problems. No matter what the difficulty, Paul had an unfailing answer, and that was Jesus Christ. Was Paul on board a leaking ship, tossed like a cork on a wildly heaving sea? What happened? Paul turned at once to Christ. The Lord told him, those that remain abide with the ship, the same shall be saved. What happened when Paul faced the mob that wanted to stone him? The answer was Christ. Was he chained to a soldier? Yes. Why not talk to him about Christ, Paul thought. To Paul, the Lord Jesus was a very real, living, and present person indeed. Then too, there was a secret of the power. He took all things as they came. He said, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak... Then I am strong. Paul learned to let go. Paul learned to let go and let God. The ways of adversity might come. Paul did not struggle. He yielded. And wonders of wonders, he was born up. No matter what came his way, Paul would always try to look and see if God was in this situation. He did not fight it. He did not trust his own strength. He did not trust his own ability. He did not resort to, he, excuse me, he said he resorted to his weakness. And he found that indeed underneath his weaknesses were those everlasting arms. The Lord Jesus would never let him down. Paul struggled, he would sink. But if he surrendered, he would swim. You feel like you're going, the old song says, I'm going to, I was going down for the last time. No one heard. If you're struggling today and you're fighting against it, you, you know, the old saying is, the worst person to try to rescue is drowning as those that fight against you. You may be fighting against the very thing that's trying to save you. I, I preached about this, and Brother Othel was just here a while back, that what they saw as a, Sister uh, Sally, as a problem, they see the Lord. They called it a spirit. They called it a ghost that's walking across the water, Sister Alexander. And they said, it's a ghost. They were afraid. They thought it was the last straw that was going to break the camel's back, Sister and I. They thought it was coming to destroy them, to take them under. But the very thing that they felt like, Brother McDaniels, that was going to destroy them was the very thing that was coming to save them. What you think may be the thing that's just going to take you under, if you quit fighting against it and realize what is the purpose for this in my life, it might be the very thing that's going to propel you to where you need to go in God. I remember, I'm going to say this, I'm done, but I'm going to say this and just in closing here. I've talked about it before. I'm not going to get into the details of it. But I went in 2000 and, I believe it was 2007. I went through, um, 2007, I believe it was. Went through the one of the greatest trials I can list it is probably Top three trials of my life was in that, no particular order. Sister Kathy, I went through one of the greatest trials, of my, and I'm not going to get into all the details of why I don't have the time, but I literally had 
a nervous breakdown during that time. Just assisting my dad at the time, and I literally, I remember I was, I just, it, it, this went on for about a year. I remember when it was all over with. See, I remember staring at the ceiling and screaming, God, if you're trying to get my attention, you got it. You can stop now. You got it. Begging God to please, Brother Martin, let up and take this out of my life. I can't deal with it anymore. I'm talking about waking up. Yeah, you're pastor at 1.30 in the morning, and I'm shaking. I remember my mother-in-law had come down to visit us one time in there in Tennessee, and I remember being so ashamed because my wife had to call my, my dad, my pastor, at 1.30 in the night because I'm curled up in a fetal position in the floor about to lose my mind. Trying to hide it from my kids. I'm not talking about seeing it. I'm talking about the middle of the mind. And all I was doing is going to service after service, asking God to take it away. After it was all over with, after I had came through it all, Sister Smith, my daddy finally relayed a conversation that he had to me. Or a conversation to me. And he finally, and what he relayed to me was this. There were some things, this is before I ever evangelized, before I ever pastor. There were some things he was trying to get out of me that he couldn't get out of me. That he knew if I didn't get it out of me, it was going to destroy me. My ministry. Not, not, I ain't talking about, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm, I'm talking about some character things that needed to change in me, if I could put it that way. So you know what he did, Brother Darrell? He said, God, I've done all I can do. I'm going to back away and I'm going to turn him over to you and let you do it. So I went for a whole year blaming the devil, despising the devil, fighting against it, losing sleep, doing everything. And I wonder if I were, how many months that would have been shortened if I would have just realized this is God, this ain't the devil. <laughs> This is God got me on the potter's wheel. This is God trying to shape me and make me into what I need to be. I'm never going to be able to evangelize one day. I'm never going to be able to pastor. I'm never going to be able to help certain situations and individuals if God is not allowed to take some things out of me and put some things in me. When I finally realized that, then God was able to Finally removed the thorn. But how long did I carry the thorn when I didn't have to? Because I didn't realize that it came from God instead of the devil. What are you trying to say today, Brother Mill? I'm trying to say, before you blame it all on the devil, why don't you check and run it by God? Before you... Get too discouraged. Why don't you look and say, God, are you in this? Is this for my good? Are you trying to make something of what I need to be? Do you got me on the anvil, God, and you're taking out things and you're, you're adding things? You got me on the potter's wheel. You're shaping me and you're breaking me down and, and you're molding me. And What are you doing, God? I just want to be what you'd have me to be, God. That's all. I'm so thankful that I got an attitude called grace. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Looking forward to the second service. We're supposed to have some visitors. Looking forward to what God's going to do. Let's have some great church and let God have his way. You're dismissed.